You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. We've talked about theories of war on this show before. We've talked about grey zone conflict, uh, different types of language around hybrid warfare. Uh, Our regular listeners probably have heard uh, my theories of naming different types of warfare and and my thoughts on it. I'm a pretty simple bloke, so I just like the term war. But there is something important about nomenclature and theory to get people thinking about what war is. So maybe we should explore that. G'day, listeners, and welcome to the Dead Prussian Podcast. Welcome to the second episode of 2022, the only uh, other episode that's going to be produced for the year. We've had a very busy year. And if you want to know more about our year, listen to the update that I've posted just before the double episode weekend. So 2022 was a consolidation year for us because we have bigger things happening in 2023 for the podcast studio as a whole um, and where we're going as a company and also uh, our publications that are going to start to come out. So instead of just interviewing people for books, we will be publishing um, some books based on uh, the Dead Prussian podcast. Um, our other shows are not having books written about them because they are mostly about fart jokes. Now, In the intro, I talked a little bit about theories of war. Now, listeners, theories of war are important. Um, Names of what we call theories of war are sometimes nauseating, but they are also important. And it pains me to say that because you know that I like the term war, I like the term warfare, and I don't really go much for all the different grey type terms. But as one of our guests very early on the show um, said, Words are important because words have power. So if you use a theory about war and you name it, you can then refer to very specific items. It's like any type of um, knowledge, right? If you're, if you're doing something and you name it, then people know what you're referring to. Very, very simple. So I'll try and hold my skepticism for tonight's guest. And tonight's guest is actually someone who's been on the show twice before. So we know he's quality. We know he's a talent we can work with. So we're pretty good there. Um, and he just published a book on uh, <laughs> or in the uh, in the 21st century. Uh, so my guest today is Dr. Matthew Ford. He is an associate professor at the Swedish Defence Academy. He's currently focusing on war and the data-saturated battlefields of the 21st century. Matthew is an honorary historical consultant at the Royal Armouries UK. He's the founding editor-in-chief of the British Journal for Military History, a journal that I know many of our listeners read, a former West Point fellow, and in 2019 was a visiting scholar at the Defence Analysis Department at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Matthew, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Mick. It's great to be back. It's good to see you still on top form. Late at night as well, given that uh, given our time zones. I'm in, currently in Stockholm. So, uh, And thanks for making some time again. Uh, it's it's uh, good to see your face, your smiley face over this Zoom call. It is, it is late at night. It's actually almost morning, I just realised. Uh, but um, <laughs> listeners, we actually scheduled this call an hour ago and we have been talking um, <laughs> and uh, catching up for an hour. So it's always good to have um, have guests uh, back on the show, guests who I get along with as well. So if you have been on the show and you haven't been called back, take that as a bloody hint. Now, <laughs> before we start discussing radical war, I'm keen to learn or at least revise, right, because I actually um, I do try and get new listeners and not all new listeners go back through our back catalogue. I wish they would. It makes me look better in terms of downloads. Um, but because we're not an advertising supported show, it doesn't make that much of a difference to me. But a lot of our listeners don't know what motivated you to become a military historian. So what motivated you to become a military historian? Uh, that's a good question, Mick. Um I've kind of been and gone through the process of becoming a military historian, and I've come out the other side, I think, um, and and now thinking about contemporary war rather than war in history per se. But um, I think it, uh, to be honest, um, what motivated me was uh, I was I probably had too many airfix kits or whatever when I was younger, um, but. Um, uh, actually, I tell you what, and one thing I'm going to acknowledge thing, one thing I, I got cancer when I was about 20. Five, I think I can't remember how long ago it was now, uh, and it really got me organized, motivated to do something I actually wanted to do, uh, rather than muck about doing all the things I was doing. Um, uh, and 
for a bit I worked in the city and I realized in London and I realized that that was fun and it paid the bills but it wasn't what I really wanted to do and I did an MA in war studies a long time ago uh, I'm that older it, Mick can vouch for the fact that I've got a gray beard um uh and um always wanted to do, do a PhD do a PhD just to figure out whether I could could actually finish it uh and uh that's what it was the it was the desire to learn and see whether I could um, put an extended piece of work together. And I surprised myself. Uh, I surprised my, it, it was really surprising to my wife as well. No, my wife was very, my wife was very, very supportive and I wouldn't have done it without her. But um, as you know, Mick, I wrote a book about guns. So uh, I've gone from guns to theories of war, which shows that I am moderately versatile or willing at least to put myself in difficult spots and do <laughs> subjects that are, con that the, 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 the so soldiers um uh have to confront on a regular basis from guns to smartphones as it were now so there, there you go that's what i and um yeah that's what i that, that's I, I i sort of uh, i knew i needed to do something different uh from what i've done in terms of the history side of things because i wanted to uh engage with the way the world uh, has changed really and it has changed a lot over the last 20 years um but that's that's something about me anyway that's a uh, that's a new layer of the onion that is um, that is Matthew Ford, and you know what the thing about that is um, quite often, and you know, as a as a current PhD candidate, um, it's good to see that they can be finished because sometimes it doesn't feel like that. But um, <laughs> it, you know, everyone tells you it's your apprenticeship, right? Like um, you've got an audience for your PhD, it's your examiners, that's it. No one else cares about the rest of it. Um, people like you are able to turn things into books, which is great. But the PhD is a, as an apprenticeship means that it's not where you um, stay as an academic, right? So it's great, um, uh, your trajectory, I mean, sure, it's great for your life and stuff, but let me just minimalise it and turn it into a lesson for people here. Um, it, it's great for listeners to see how academics evolve and, 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 and apply the lessons that they learn in their research and the critical thinking skills to problems that people are more familiar with as well, right? Um, although... You know your your book on small arms, um, one of our most popular episodes ever. I think it was um, for quite a long time the most um, downloaded episode. The the saddest thing about this show is the very first episode is the most downloaded show because a lot a lot of people <laughs> try and start at number one, but then they quickly realise one, you know. I sucked at this show for a very, very long time. Uh, <laughs> then, then all of a sudden, this became brilliant. So I, was, I had this really, really good turning point. But, um, but also, this show is not a chronological order type show. You can listen to any episode. It's a pick and choose, right? It's a pick mix at the at the supermarket. Um, some days you feel like walnuts. Some days you feel like peanuts. Um, most days I just feel nuts. But one of the <laughs> things that is really interesting is that your your episode has maintained so much supremacy and dominance. I'm not going to talk about the stats too much here because I've already insulted other previous guests on the show once tonight, so I'm not going to make it feel worse. But it, it it was quite popular, and I'm kind of hoping that we'll, uh, we'll boost the stats because I'm only releasing two episodes this year. So um, having someone talk about a uh, a new theory of war where they where they um, will get to it, but where, you know, you, you question some, some hallowed territory, um, yeah. which is great. I mean, this whole show is about questioning that particular guy in the way that he questioned, right? Um, yeah. but, you know, there'll be some feathers ruffled and we, we've had some fun on Twitter already about it. Um, we but have. we'll get to that. Um, and the other thing, listeners, that you really need to understand is um, both Matt and I do have beards and I have grey in my beard, but um, you can't tell when looking at Matt's because his is like white as snow and makes mine, <laughs> makes mine look really dark. Uh, which is great. So that's a, that's another really important thing for listeners to understand is that I look youthful um, because my beard is much darker. Um, now, if, if you still want to, if you still want to stay on the show, because um, I've insulted all the other guests, I had to insult you to kind of even the playing field. <laughs> you've recently published a book called Radical War with your co-author Andrew Hoskins, um, and this is this got me piqued. The discussion on social media about this and 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 a little bit of banter about it. Um, because as you know, as I said in the intro, like I like to take the piss out of um, different theories of war and their names, but yeah. it's a it, it's a pretty interesting sort of premise with your book. So what is what is the main focus of of radical war? Yeah, so I mean, let's get something about the title out of the way early on. I mean, you know, Andrew and I, Andrew is a professor of um, uh, media and memory 
uh, up at Glasgow University. Um, and we met actually in the uh, basement of the Ministry of Defence uh, in the UK, where he was doing some work on archives. Mm. And the fact of the matter is, is that the, the book Radical War, it seems unlikely at the time, but the, our book was, I thought, was going to be on the structure of archives. And in fact, it, there is a lot in the book about archives. Mm. But I thought it was actually going to be about um, how archiving works in a military context. Mm. Uh, but it, in the, it, what Andrew did was to turn around and say, no, we should write a book about media and war. Mm. And uh, so the book that I thought we were writing it wasn't the book that we ended up writing. Uh, so, you know, I, you asked me what tempted me to be a historian. Well, I thought this was going to be a book as a historian interested in the structure of knowledge and how archives worked. Uh, and of course, um, what's actually happened is, is that we're interested in how archives work in a digitalized context. Mm. And it's once we go from, um, once we start introducing all things digital, then it, we start to realize that it's about, try, we, what we started to realize is that this is a book about how, war and uh, uh, media in the 21st century start to come together. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the media sphere has changed enormously, as you know, Mick, enormously since 2000. Since, you know, our, our starting point in, you know, Andrew's specialism was on the Gulf War in 1991 and the, how media worked in, uh, during, that, during that war. And he's done a load more uh, uh, on uh, establishing memory studies and all sorts of other bits and pieces as a, as fields of uh, uh, discipline. Um, uh, but we called it radical war partly because we were trying to tweak the noses of people doing media studies who don't really want to talk about war and to tweak the nose of people doing war studies who the last thing they want to do is talk about media. Uh, and which is something ironic, really, because they've both got studies in the title. So how do we get them to actually talk to each other? We'll give it a we give it a title, Radical War, that is going to definitely annoy people, right? <laughs> and I'm not joking. You know, I, I'm like you. I see all of these different versions of war, grey zone, hybrid, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, um, of course, it's, it's somewhat ironic that then we call something Radical War uh, when we are actually reflecting on the fact that those, those perspectives are, try, are, are, ref, are reflecting how hard it is to try and push Clausewitz in forms of war into contemporary how contemporary practice and for us at least some of the challenge here is is that actually we've gone through something of a it's going to sound a bit poncy here but something of an epistemic revolution the way we come to understand the world has changed over the last 20 years and in society more broadly it's it's you know people are understanding the world through their digital devices and literally in the palm of their hand you know um and so the book radical war it is really an effort to try to understand how uh, society has changed in terms of it, how it comes to understand what's going on about the place, how it enge how we engage with each other. That the, all things digital is not a sort of add-on or a separate, in military parlance, a separate domain, yeah. but is actually it, it's literally how we work. We everything. It, it, the clever um, uh, academic framing for this is everything is deeply mediatized. There's not a single thing that hasn't been touched by a digital, a digital referent, right? Everything is digital yeah. in some way, shape, or form. Whether even when you switch on your light, there's been um, that's a, a, a dis distinctly analog process. You know, just flipping a switch, but you know the power that has got you, got to your you, onto the grid and to you has been mod has actually been um, uh, uh, made. All of that's been made possible through processes that are themselves controlled by computers and processes of digital uh, uh, um, uh, digital processes, even online processes. And of course, if you had your phone connected to you know your smart home, mm. then you could do it all before you walk in the door anyway and turn your lights on and all this other stuff, right? So, um, you know, it, it was really, so well, how has society changed? And if, and then it was like, let's reconnect war and society and then think about, what that might mean in terms of how we come to understand war. That's where the book came from. And so in terms of a theory, uh, you know, it's it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a theory. It's our effort to try and map the dimensions of this problem space hmm. uh, in terms of how we might understand living in the 21st century in a highly connected, highly digital environment. 
Uh, and what that means when you know you're sitting on the tube or on the bus or something, and you're watching genocide on your phone that has just been uploaded by someone on the other side of the planet, right? And there you are. Do you amplify it, or do you do you sit back and be horrified, or do you report the content, or does the does the social media platform even have reporting function, you know, at all, even, right? So. Once you shift the dynamic away from just looking at the world from a purely military perspective, what do we? What happens? You, you end up having to talk about media and political violence. That's if you're if you're if you're going to, you know, we're starting from a different different place to where most people in uniform are, and that's that's I think where some of the banter online was 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 being generated. I don't know whether which I thoroughly enjoy, and I'm you know I'm I, I you know I sent this book to Beatrice Huser. Um, and Mike Rainsborough, both deeply, deeply steeped in Clausewitz. Yeah. You know, Beatrice, Beatrice, this before publication, Beatrice, Beatrice violently disagreed with it, but she then said it's the most interesting thing she'd read, <laughs> read in ages. And I was like, oh, I can probably deal with that. You know, it's a, you know, it's it's a first, it's a serious attempt to try and understand what what society, war and society looks like in the 21st, or how we might understand war in a society in the 21st century. That's the thing. You, um, as as someone who spent the first twenty years of his adult life in uh, in in uniform in the business of war, and then now spending you know the next part of my career in uh, media and communications, um, it sounds like a perfect book just to map out, um, you know, my own my own career trajectory. Um, but it's interesting how you talk about, um, you know, what happens if you remove the military component from war, and and where we find ourselves right now, and what what we what elements of war are available to society in terms of how they experience war. And, you know, we've talked about on the show um, that societies in in, in pre-modern times generally experienced war differently and, and, and somewhat more catastrophically for a lot of them. And, you know, World War One and World War Two, or the First World War and the Second World War there, I've covered everyone in the Anglosphere by using both terms uh, for each. But... Um, you know, that, they tend to be the exception in a lot of ways because they were so catastrophic. But, you know, war for a lot of societies, they, they they knew about war because they experienced it, but the way they experienced it was a little bit different because now we, we you know, a lot of people experience war as four years. Um, so it's interesting um, on how the perception of war is affected uh, by the modern media landscape and information. Um, I, I love that, um, I love that there's, you know, there's a, there's a tongue-in-cheek, um, sort of title that will get people focused, right? Because they, you know, people will read this book to disagree with you, which is great. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely the case. That's that's. Yeah. I mean, we, we we expect we, we don't. I don't mind being wrong. I know. <laughs> and, you know, I'm an, I'm an academic. You know, we, we eventually There's more research opportunities if you are wrong. That's that's right. To be honest, and in fact, the last six, I you know, since the war in Ukraine, I've been basically working to figure out how wrong radical war is right mm. you know, we wrote the book from 2019 onwards mm. uh and uh you know there were lots of antecedents um in syria in in israel uh in various places um even in kyrgyzstan before the war started you know when people when the when the response was just to switch the internet off yeah. um uh there's there, there were lots of antecedents for radical war that we could um, draw on that, but we never had the opportunity to see how it might be operationalized in a in a conventional sense. Yeah, and um, you know, it's fair to say that in the book came out in March in the UK and in July in the US. Um, and uh, in March, I was I was really praying that they wouldn't go to war. To be honest, well, I'm praying that they don't. They actually, the war ends quickly anyway. But you know, um, I, because it's nothing like having a book out on war. And then a war starts just to show you how wrong you really are. <laughs> um, but the, 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 truth, the truth of it is, is that there were plenty of things, there are plenty of things in radical war that still hold some hold um, um, water. So I called um, the smartphone a weapon in radical war. And I gave the manuscript to Mike Rainsborough and he said, what are you talking about? That's overblown, isn't it? Mike, Mike being an arch Clausewitzian, a phone, a weapon, what are you talking about? It's such nonsense. And I was tempted to take it out, but I left it in, or I I, I I changed the language a little bit just to keep him on site. You know, not that he's going to go and put it, the book on his reading list because he's an arch Clausewitzian, but yeah. uh, 
you know, uh, and then lo and behold, the war in Ukraine starts. And actually, what are they doing? They're using their phone to uh, with an app to, 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 uh, as part of the targeting cycle. Yeah. And so you're photographing things, you're uploading it to a fusion cell, and boom, you know, your phone is part of the bloody whole weaponized, you know, civilians have been weaponized. Yep. You know, it's not just they are participating. And I suppose that's the... I suppose that's the key for us. You know, it's war is a, a, a radically different in that the phone is a, a, a technology that allows you to um, uh, produce, uh, publish, and amplify all from one device, right? So you you know you effectively you are cutting out the news media yeah. because you don't, you know, traditional news media because you as an individual can just take a photo of something upload it and then broadcast it and then you know you could amplify it you don't you can be on the front lines to do that mm. but you can also be on a tube or a bus in london doing it and and still participate and that technology that technology has definitely had a serious impact on how we come to understand war i mean we could not all this open source stuff sure there's a lot of open source stuff that um, doesn't rely on uh, smartphone technology, but the fact is, is that 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 is enabling mm. the rapid integration of uh, knowledge about what's going on on the battlefield in a way that was never possible twenty years ago. You know, yeah. just what. And you, your smartphone is not just an intelligence tool, a broadcast tool. It is also a command and control tool. You can control yeah. the weaponized racing drone from a smartphone, and they're, they're doing it right. And and you talk yeah. about antecedents. You know, we saw we were seeing videos online of um, strikes from weaponized um, hobbyist drones. Um, and I'll use the term drones rather than the more technical UAS because you know the audience will love to. Yeah, you know, I'll lose half my listeners if I start using acronyms. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. The other half will. Um, Will be really excited. I'm using acronyms, but they probably need to. Um, they probably need to grow their hair a little bit longer and stop wearing, um, starched clothes. But um, the, you know, we saw that in Syria, right? So some of the antecedents, some of the trends in the antecedents were were are being pretty true because some of the videos you could almost do like for like. Some of the yeah. videos of strikes on Islamic State or the Syrian forces. Um, you know, you, you can sit there and say that they're using very very similar innovation because you know innovation, um, comes in waves and sometimes you see it repeating. Um, as a as you know, as someone with an ontological perspective, as a constructionist, I love how you're talking about um, the perception of war and the meaning of war for society and how it's changed because of the, the information. And one one bit in your book, you talk about war and the democratization of perception. Yeah, and, uh, and, and you've touched a little bit on that um, ever 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 so closely um, in your in in what we were talking about just before when you talk about you know the, the prevalence of the smartphone and who's being cut out. Of the production cycle in terms of information, but yeah. what is what is in terms of radical war? What is the democratization of perception, and, and and kind of how does it relate to war in particular? I think it, it sort of connects back to the, the the structures of knowledge that uh, you know previously you'd have establishment. You could construct a particular narrative about war. Mm. Uh, you know, the editorial process from mainstream media would work quite closely with the armed forces themselves and they would they would be able to frame war in a particular way mm. and uh now that whole uh, paradigm has has gone right you know it's of course it still exists in different forms but it's part of a, a competing information ecosystem or what we've been calling a new war ecology uh, again going back to you, the point that you made earlier on we kind of had to name some of these things mm. so that we could con start hanging the conceptual framework together but you know if we talk about a new war ecology what we're talking about is the information infrastructure the actual the hardware but all the service centers all the other bits and pieces the, the all of that stuff that the critical infrastructure that makes it possible but also the the social media platforms also the the people with their phones, also people, uh, mainstream media, and and actually just everyone participating. And this is, and of course, you know, you go to different parts of the world, and those, though the distribution of this new war ecology is uneven, right? It's, you know, in, in Myanmar, you've got one way of engaging with the world through Facebook, and of course, Facebook then becomes a key driver for drive uh, for uh, pushing genocide in Myanmar, and Facebook had to apologise for that in 2018. Everyone got. 
everyone got fed up about um, how Facebook was shaping the news, the, the, whether they were prepared to pay tax in Australia. No one gave a toss about the fact that Facebook was amplifying genocide in Myanmar, right? Essentially, uh, a, a modern version of the Rwandan radio station, right? Like exactly. Uh, but you know, that's a, that's a media media ecosystem that's being dropped into Myanmar without any understanding about how um, uh, people in Myanmar might engage with their media platforms or what it might do or, you know, and so there's a sort of, when you've got a sort of a, a very close rupture, you know, there's a real clash of cultures, a sort of Silicon Valley kind of dropping this thing into a place where, you know, people are, uh, you know, you don't even need a data plan in in Myanmar because, um, you know, Facebook becomes the internet. So they just package into the internet up onto your phone, right? And so you don't you don't need to access the web. The, the, the web is Facebook. But, you yeah. know, in Tigray, Tigray has been, uh, recently, there's been a lot of amplification of violence um, in Tigray. So, and I th uh, through um, Facebook, through um, social media platforms. And I think that, that, that uh, in terms of democratization, I think we, I used the word participate earlier, um, you know, people are actively shaping and engaging with the world. Uh, and the distinction between a sort of digital and analog domains has just gone, it seems to me. You know, we are everything we're doing. You know, even our chat now is over Zoom. Yeah. Or a computer. And so, you know, we it, it's just not even it's it, it, it seems axiomatic to me. Uh, in fact, so obvious, I find it hard to sort of, um, uh, uh, when people say, oh, the smartphones or social, it's just smartphones, it's just social media, it's just, you know, it's not real. You go, well, hold on a minute, you know, <laughs> you know, kids, your kids have got three screens going. One of them, one of them, one of them is to do their homework. One of them is to watch a film explaining what their homework's about. And one of them is to talk to their mates yeah. to try and make sense of the film and their homework, right? So, you know, that that, that is a... That, that's a real thing that I don't think we can easily deny. And when, when, um, when uh, sometimes I, I listen to the sort of debates that sort of war hasn't, war's kind of fixed, that the nature of, I mean, without wanting to get back into Clausewitz again, but necessarily, you know, the nature of war has is fixed, the character of war has changed. I understand absolutely. But, you know, if you think about it for a moment, if if everything we've understand everything we understand is through digital tech, uh, we need to reflect on what that what that structure of knowledge has done to, in terms of our, how we come to understand the world. In, in my Ponzi word Ponzi way of framing it, we've gone through an epistemic revolution this last twenty years, mm. and we need to engage we, we, to say that it's not changed things is just us. <laughs> put simply. <laughs> That's good. I phrased perfectly for this show because I was just about to say, you know, one, one of my favourite phrases when I was working in um, social media management for a, you know a large large Australian public institution, um, and trying to explain it to people that you know this is actually important because one you can you can actually communicate better without without a dilution of your message through a media organisation that may want to put their own perception on it uh, spin on it for the for their viewers, but. Um, also, it's it's everyone in the village now has a microphone or a megaphone, yeah. um, including the idiots, um, and and so not everyone's motivation to use that megaphone is the same or um, aligned with the megaphone producer. Hey, I'm going to give everyone a megaphone, and it'll be great because then they can finally have their voices heard without an understanding of what those might do and and i say that as an as an idiot who is sitting behind a microphone using a lot of digital technology here to have a chat um about this in a show that i produce uh but to be honest if it wasn't for digital technology you know there's no way i could have got this off the ground right to to podcast to become better at production uh and and build something like the depression where we feel that we add value at tdp shoes we feel that we add value to the world in discussing these things um, and trying to get people um, applying Clausewitz's approaches to understand, uh, trying to understand war as opposed to applying Clausewitz's words to framing how you fight a war. Um, and and all of it's enabled through digital technology. Um, and when I started out, like, you know, I didn't think it would go very well, but then you get skills and then you learn and then you you, you grow, right? And that's very different than if I had have recorded it on a cassette tape, you know, 
a while ago. I won't say how long ago because, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember cassette tapes are probably of a certain vintage. But, you know, it, it, it's very, very different, right, um, because you can communicate technology. I mean, we're recording this, you know, on a Friday night, Saturday morning. Um, this will be out by Sunday. This will be edited yeah. out by Sunday and people will be discussing these concepts and there will be people who are operational commanders around the world who listen to this show starting to think about some of the lessons you're talking about, right? So the ability yeah. to, to, to to distribute information, knowledge, which is important, you talked about an epistemic revolution, um, the ability to disseminate knowledge um, you know, is, is, is so vast um, yeah. and, and, and it's just, a yeah, you know, it's fascinating to still hear the argument, oh, but it's just the internet or it's just social media. And these arguments haven't gone away, right? We, and, and, and the people it, minimizing the Twitter, Twitter issues at the moment, minimizing what Twitter means, um, when Twitter has literally been the, the engine behind revolutions. Yes. And so let's just, t t there's two things, right? One is, is that the speed at which this can happen, right? So in the, the uh, I really enjoyed the work that um, you Aussies were doing on accelerated war, accelerated mm -hmm. warfare, sorry, let's just be more precise. Um, because it seems to me that that's, uh, you know, if you, if you want to beat the narrative, then, you know, you need to accelerate the, the targeting, the, the, the whole bang to pressing the button to making things go bang mm. and if you can then beat the narrative because you're ahead of the narrative right now I, there's all sorts of conceptual and structural challenges in there and uh of course i'm not a technological determinist as you know because you will have read uh, my first book on guns yep. um so you know there are all sorts of social issues going on in that but it's an interesting Concept. So one of the, I think, and that points to one of the things that sort of in the back of radical war, which is instead of looking at things in terms of um, uh, uh, geography or, or, or place, we're thinking about things in terms of speed and how speed shapes um, our perception, how speed works in different ways and across different media, and how those that speed produces digital can shape digital existing digital divides and can be exploited by in in terms of how uh info spaces start working right uh so you know there's a fundamental difference between analog and digital media uh, and there's a fundamental difference between social media and mainstream media you know even people without phones i gave a talk to the national army museum in london a, a month or so ago and there were a couple of uh, uh, people in there who didn't have smartphones didn't have a phone at all um but the idea that their lives aren't being influenced by people who do have smartphones is is a nonsense right um yeah. because because twitter the journalists and everyone else are using social media to get into the stories and to understand what's going on so even if you're not online you are still being influenced by people who are and of course you know if you look at the in, in, the in the uh, telecoms, the international telecoms union, you'll find like something like ninety six, seven percent of the world is uh, has a cellular connection, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, in those parts of the world that don't, you don't want to influence anyway. And if you're hanging out there, you're probably you're probably known, right? You know, they even got Bin Laden after a while, and he was off off the grid, right? So, you know, it's that that process of um, understanding um, uh, who's on or off the grid that that those digital divides facilitate that exercise right yeah um but the, the flip side is is you know if you you also alluded to twitter right twitter and i said started this conversation with our reference to archives you know a lot of people are kind of enjoying the possibility that the whole thing folds um but basically that's just going to bugger up future historians you know they Twitter is an archive. It has an archive of stuff. You know, who's going to keep hold of that material? And where is it going to go? You know, you can see a lot of organizations, probably the APIs are scraping Twitter furiously right now to make sure that we've got some kind of record of what has been discussed. But um, even that is interesting, right? Because so who, who, which organizations are going to keep that stuff? And how are they going to disseminate it? And what's going to happen to it? And how's that then going to frame particular narratives of all sorts of things, you know, including war? Mm. Uh, and that 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 kind of we we've forgotten how integral the, these things are to our lives because we just they're mundane now, yeah. and the mundanity 
I, th I think again, radical war was just about trying to say, look, look at how things have changed. It's not um, from a from a military point of view. This is this is important to reflect on because it's it's basically saying that the ecosystem that military folk have to work in is beyond their control, really. Um, and worse, the the social media platforms themselves demonstrate lots of times that they aren't in control of their platforms either. Yeah. So you've got this kind of, in terms of people relying on a prism that is actually deeply unstable and uh, amplifies bad news quicker than it does good news, mm. uh, and uh, it is is actually shaping people's perceptions about how the world is working. And they don't. They can be on the front lines, and they can be a long way away from the front lines. Uh, but they, what we're seeing, I suppose ultimately here is a sort of splintering of realities mm. um, which which is really challenging from a war and society point of view how do you get an armed force to work when actually people's shared understanding of what society is doesn't exist in the same kind of way it did mm. 20 years ago right or 30 years ago you know when commemoration of a war is on uh, that is still going is happening online right now you know how does uh, a, an armed force then figure out, or society and the state, for example, come up with an official commemoration when that whole process of commemoration is already being shaped by society. Well, that's happened, you know, before, but when it's happening online in tra amongst transnational communities, not just amongst the particular, you know, you've got a wholly, a completely different framing of what how people s gain a sense of belonging in society right or belonging to they have multiple of, of course this is old news you know you've got multiple multiple identities um uh and you can be part of all these different communities in Russia, but, but, you know, but, right? like there's there's different there's there's new it's not based on ethnicity nationality it's it's not based on uh you know trades professions you have those identities still and then you have the online identities you have um, people who who relate to different things um, online. It's you know a, a, a non-war example is uh, is the online gaming community. There are you know the gamers versus people who are game devs. Um, it is really interesting to see which ones people identify with, and yeah. you know, that that is a separate identity. And then you have those people interacting based on that. So you have like the the game dev community in support of Ukraine. Um, yeah, it's 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 okay. someone will identify more with their online community to commemorate a ongoing conflict than they would with their local community where they live, where they buy their milk, where they, you know, buy their bread. Um, probably the same place. I buy my bread and milk from the same place because you know the shopkeeper's a really good guy. But um, what what's <laughs> interesting when you talk about the you know people who don't have phones and they say you know I read my paper in the in, you know I read I get my news in print. Well, nothing generally goes to print in a newspaper these days that hasn't been tested online for user audience take up right um we know right. that journalism is very branded uh, and a lot of a lot of news organizations almost apply brand journalism and market analysis approach because print print papers are expensive to maintain compared to online yeah. so, so if it doesn't get the clicks it doesn't go into the print paper um yeah. so and you know one one I always love to argue with people is literally where did you get your money from today uh, you know, you've got a digital card, plastic card that has digital technology sitting in your pocket. Yeah, you know, it's it's done. Now we've talked a bit about you've talked a bit about data, and data is uh, a key part of your book. In fact, there's a whole part called data. Um, it's part one for listeners who are looking to get the book. Um, great part. Um, probably not as good as part two or part three because the book keeps going. Um, but part one's pretty good. Um, you talk about the, the the role of data on the battlefield. Now we've talked a little bit about now, but how has the influx of data changed war? Well, you can see. I mean, um, I mean, it, the, the, it's it's we we in just in terms of Ukraine over the last eight months. How long is it now? Eight months? Nine months? I don't. Know, I can't remember. Eight months? Nine months? Um, you know, the, we, there's not a thing. There's not a thing. The journalists could not do what they do without. The material that's being published online, mm. you know, whether it's you know, uh, it, you know, your your phone both is a source that you can publish stuff with it, but you're also a data point in the in the overall infosphere, and you know, it's a sensor in that you can switch it on, 
Uh, you can turn the mic on, you can turn the uh, camera on, you know, and people are people, you know, in the first, was it in the first 10 years of the war in uh, um, the first 10 years of the war in Syria, um, they produced something like, uh, was it 40 years of footage? Um, and in the first 80 days of the war in Ukraine, they've produced something like 10 years of footage. You know, who's going to produce, who's going to go through that? Right. You know, we've got a lot of people, Bellingcat and a lot of really smart lawyers and others, um, you know, the Barclay Protocol over in um, uh, coming out of the States, which is about trying to effectively find a, a, a appropriate formula to ensure that imagery that is broadcast online can then also can be part of a war crimes tribunal. You've got a lot of people working on how to make this all happen. And of course, a lot of that is crowdsourced effort. Mm. And it's amazing. And just the just the scale of organization needed to try and keep up with what's going on is is amazing. But if you think about it for a moment, the amount of footage that is being produced that is going to, you know, how much time are we going to have to go through and actually look to prosecute people? Mm. It's it, we are suffering from too much information. It's it's enormous. It, and it's beyond human comprehension the amount of data that's being that's coming out, right? So, of course, you might then say, "Well, what we need to do is apply some kind of algorithm or AI or something to to scan and all the rest of it." But of course, those technologies themselves sort of reflect the values of those people who pre- created them in the first place. They reflect what people are looking for, and all the other bits and pieces. There's the sort of value laden, and this is where I can go back to the, some of the work I did on guns, which is showing how the politics of guns. You know how that works. Different interest groups that are associated with that, and you can the same happens with AI. Now, an AI is not equally distributed, right? You know, it's not I- available to everyone. You know, I, there is a there is a uh, mismatch between what I can do as an ordinary user and what my old uh, mates at Sussex University um, in the informatics department can do, given that they've got a quantum computer, right? They can potentially trace narratives across platforms. Uh, I definitely can't. I don't have the software. And even if I did have the software, I wouldn't have the know-how, right? And that disparity creates all sorts of digital divides that are in- instantly exploitable, right? They just provide all sorts of opportunities. You know, just, but even if we think about, I had a, a listen, went to a talk um, the other day um, and I heard uh, people from the Ukrainian Ministry of Information uh, uh, talk about how they were trying to manage the, um, media, the media space, media sphere in in um, in Ukraine, right? And there, there was amazing, um, a really dedicated bunch of people, uh, and obviously fighting for their country and, put, and putting their putting their back to the wheel. And it was impressive stuff. But there's 23 of them, right? And that you know, basically working 18 hour days flat out to try and generate the material necessary to sort of drive a. Uh, the stand with me, stand with Ukraine, um, kind of narratives and the rest of it. That's an enormous effort, and yet they can't. They have not been. They've only been able to reach um, the, the Europe and the West more broadly in terms of shaping the info, the info space. If you go to um, the Middle East, North Africa, uh, South America, India, China, of course, it's completely different media scape. Yeah. And their capacity to reach those audiences and shape the the politics of those places is has, has not been successful. You know that that Zelensky has not been able to talk um, uh, to parliaments in various African countries, principally because the you know they 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 don't want to have to choose. They, yeah. Their stroke, you know, their politics isn't amenable, and social media and mainstream media isn't being shaped by uh, the Ukrainians successfully enough to actually get beyond that. And, yeah. um, you know, they're in a, com- that, that the data that they can, uh, try to use to, um, shape narratives. Um, uh, it, it, there are a bunch of other people trying to do the, uh, the same on the other side. Uh, but even if we take that at, what to, at one, uh, on one end of it, you know, as I was saying, you know, the smartphones are part of the, uh, simply they're creating data, but they're also, being effectively, it's not just smartphones, it's webcams, connected devices. They're data points that are a bit uh, can be used as part of the targeting cycle. So it's not just that the data is that data points are uh, helping us frame how we might make sense of what's going on, but it's also 
information that can open source information that can be used in in terms of targeting and identifying um, uh, patterns of life and uh, where adversary, adversary locations you know what were the russians doing right at the beginning of the war in ukraine before you know they were trying to hack loads of data uh on people so that they could they would have a list of people who might support them and who might not right yeah. that when, when so you know we haven't got to a point yet where uh, smartphones and occupation enable um uh, enable smarter smarter uh occupation right we, we you know what uh, are we seeing um uh data being used uh to help drive genocide i don't know you know this is these are big questions people pick up their phone in 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 ukraine start filming a russian and they become a combatant right mm -hmm. they, partly because the russians don't know whether they're being that phone's being used for targeting so it, it's it, it, the, the, and of course, data is landing on different desks within Ministry of Defence at different speeds, partly from compartmentalisation, principally because information infra infrastructures within the armed forces are crap by comparison to civilian. And so you'll see stuff, if you're in uniform, you'll see stuff online before you'll see it in the office. Yeah. And if you do see it in the office, you might be tempted, it, it, may, it, it may be... It may be more corroborated and uh, 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 useful information, but yeah. the stuff that's online is already shaping perception, and you're going to have to fight that, whatever happens, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, information data is just is being produced up in lots of different places, and uh, is has a sort of uneven speed and distribution trajectory off the battlefield, and radical war is trying to get at what that those trajectories are. And how they shape understanding and learning. You know, if you're going to do in in an armed forces context, when do you do the post operation report? You know, literally, you know, this this thing is being fought 24 7, 365 days of the year. When does something end? You know, there isn't an end point, right? You've got you're literally you're learning as a process rather than uh, as if it's just you know there's a break in the cycle where you can stop for a moment, right? Yeah, you're you're operating as a process. Hopefully, hopefully they're learning, but. Maybe we, we won't take that necessarily for granted. I do I do like um the, the you, you mentioned you know African governments, Middle Eastern governments, you know, different parts of the world that, that Ukraine haven't been able to reach. And um interestingly enough, you know, like I've I've kicked around some African countries um in some pretty remote areas. And uh yeah, even ten years ago, like you'd be amazed where you can find a cell phone. Even in even in some places I've visited in South America, right? Like, you know, being being in the middle of a a a reed town like on Lake Titicaca, which is just a funny name. Um, but you'll sit there, <laughs> you'll see a satellite dish, right, hooked up to solar power and a phone. Um, yeah. Places where they have centralized running water, no indoor plumbing. They've got they're they're connected to the world, um, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily mean they're connected to the same part of the digital world that that you are and you're operating in. And this this brings us to the second part of your book, which ties to that data um and you know i think you touched on it quite well when you were talking about um the, the reach you know there's lots of data and understanding it is important but you go on to discuss the concept of attention and how attention relates to to, to modern war in fact how attention relates to radical war how, how why is attention important why did you choose that as the second part for for radical war so i think i mean what what we wanted to try and get at is why we pay why we look at some things and ignore others why is this particular conflict you know that we're, we're paying a lot of attention to the war in ukraine but no attention to war in tigray right uh well is one is it because one's closer is it because you know europeans are more interested in um european stuff is it because it's got more impact there's all sorts of ways of explaining it but one of the ways is because actually structural resources are dedicated towards um, away from Tigray, right? You know, there's lots of, and that, that's where we get to control. But that that certainly shapes attention, right? Um, and uh, you, there's there's a sort of we need to understand some of the schematizations, some of the ways that frame how we come to pay attention to things, right? Some of it's structural, right? Some of it's some of it's that, um, and this is a contested claim. Um, uh, Axel Bruns might have a different view, uh, but you know, some studies have shown that facts move lies move quicker around the web than facts right now and fact you know even facts checking as a as a, a a way of doing work strikes me in the context of 
you know, 10 years of footage in eight, in eight months or six months, or whatever it is, 80 days, sorry, in Ukraine, you know, 10 years. How do you do, how do you do fact checking there? Yeah. It's just, you know, it's, it's. These are redundant by the time you've done the fact check. Yeah, I mean, the, the the guys who run the fact check, there was a, uh, I listened to a talk by a really um, interesting um, organisation that does fact checking. You know, they have potentially 100,000 100, different um, things to fact check every day and they fact check 10, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's, <laughs> you see what, you know, this is, this is structural here that we're talking about. Yeah. So then the question is, is how you met, how can, well, how does attention get framed? And for us, it seems to me that we're, we're for us, we're sort of reflecting on um, attention as sort of how existing schemas, existing framings help us make sense of the world. Mm. And this is both in theory, but also in history. You know, there are theories that we use to try and make sense of the world. And there's history. And there is also even the media itself. There's sort of resonances in how different types of media keep getting reproduced in the media scape itself as a way of helping us have a have a, a touch point that tells us oh this this particular moment is a bit like that last one and yeah. that helps us make sense of it right um the the the, the challenge now is is that the, the these these modes of control are uh, uh, tend to be at a meta level and uh, you can see it in the sorts of pr type work that's being done that's trying to shape agendas and narratives and there's a you know some really interesting organizations that, are, that can track narratives certainly at a at a, 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 a sort of so society level or a national level or a community level where they can see inputs and outputs and how people respond or not to particular narrative forms um but to, to do that as sort of at a at a meta level at a platform level that strikes me as being very hard unless you're at the center of the center of the beast as it were unless you're actually elon uh manipulating you know when he's posting some and how some, much tracking the narrative right as opposed to just yeah. just, just influencing it um yeah he, he's you know when he's posting really nasty you know some crappy thing with a twitter logo on it that's a bit off and you think you're just you're just destroying the value of your business here are you sure you want to do that as advertisers pull out but one thing he is finding is is how many people are actually engaging with his with his I mean, tweet. Apple, his engagement with Apple this week, you know, um, oh. you know, he he started um, criticizing the fact that Apple was threatening to pull out um, Twitter off the App Store, and then had a meeting and said, you know, Apple were never considering to do that. You know, yeah, you look at that, and you've got the people that say, you know, he really schooled Apple and and made Tim Cook come to heel, or. He just really wanted a meeting with Tim Cook and couldn't get one any other way. But he had the world's one of the world's biggest platforms and knew that he could do it that way. I don't know yeah. what it was, but it's it's a it's a level of attention that we that people are paying to large narratives. Um, but the trajectories and and you know you talk about knowledge trajectories in your uh, in in our last well one of our last chats because you're you're very popular on this show. Um, you know having done some work on narrative trajectories in the past, you know, I used to use um, uh, films like Star Wars and New Hope, those sorts of things to help people. And there's some great, there's some great academic work on Star Wars and New Hope as a narrative trajectory, right? That's really easy to do for the traditional mono myth and the hero's journey. It's really yeah. hard to do um, at a very, uh, at a very complex meta level when you have multiple platforms and multiple information. And, yeah. and then, you know, we talked a little bit about you talked a little bit about military, and you know, one thing I'd like to say is that if you've got a hundred thousand things to fact check and you're only getting through ten a day, your boss needs to talk to you about your KPI achievement. But um, <laughs> in the final section of your book, you you just you, you label it a term that I find really interesting, right? And this is something that my perception of has changed since I left the military and knowing how the military operates and how the military likes to operate, right? And, and, and they, they train, train their people. And, you know, you, you, there's a classic on Moltke, the older, saying, you know, um, no, you know planning's, planning's important, the plan isn't. Um, and, you know, no plan survives for a shot of battle, but being able to plan is good. But militaries like to control things. Um, yeah. Yeah, in Australia, you know, we're, we're infamous for not um, engaging with our media over the past 20 years in the long war. Uh, and 
and now we're going through some pretty nasty uh, investigations into potential war crimes that are uh, arguably um, some of the information about this might have come out if there were embedded media teams. I'm not saying that they could or could not have prevented the things that have been alleged to have occurred, but when you have media with you in a war, you tend to have things exposed quicker. Um, yeah. But control is important to a military, and you know part of the problem I think of the West was they tried to control the war in Central Asia and and, and the Middle East rather than actually fight it. So your book talks about control. So what is the relationship between control and I like the term new ecology of war, um, even though I say I hate new terms, but I do like it. <laughs> so um, what is the relationship between control and the new ecology of war and and, and radical war? So. Um... Uh, the, the thing about your story there on the uh, war crimes stuff is, is that it seems to me that digi- all things digital, it leaks. It's mm-hmm. leaky. You know, I don't know if it's the right. For it. It, if it, it's once it's hit a digital platform, it's gonna it's gonna go get out and about, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's instantly shareable. It's you know you can move it around. Also, you can lose it, right? It's you, mm-hmm. there's um, a, a great academic at UCL, um, David Witherburn, who writes uh, does a lot of work on memory on memory decay he calls it where you know if you've ever experienced um uh, a, a digital rights issue with your music and your music disappears from the cloud or you've got one album replaced with another one because they've updated the digital rights on it you know very well that you're regularly losing data mm. uh and um and uh, and so there's a sort of it, on the one hand, it's it, it, this stuff gets out and about. On the other hand, it gets lost, right? Mm. Uh, but it's all it, it, it's all enabled, if you like, by the sort of underlying critical infrastructures that make it possible for you to connect. And so, it's it, the, the control bit is shaped by how and who and on what platforms you connect, right? Um, if you're in the war, in, if you're in the, in um, Syria, you know it was important to know which network you were connecting to. Because if you connected to the wrong network, you're suddenly broadcasting out to a to Assad, and you know his guys are reading everything you're saying, mm. and you're you're actually giving away important information that otherwise you were just trying to communicate with your family or something else, right? So you need to know what, yeah, and the war might go over and above and around you, but those, those the cloud networks are still there, right? And they get taken over and shaped the rest of it. So you need to, and that sort of frames how information is produced because, you know, what if you're going to be broadcasting over a net that is owned, by, that is controlled by someone else, you, you know, you've got to be careful about what you say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you've got this sort of potential to self-censor as much as you've got to collect mm. and once you get down to that level you've got to start thinking about how what, how control is working in this space right you know that's why the belt and road stuff and all the china all the stuff that the chinese are doing is really fascinating because it's 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 infrastructure is influence rather than uh you know and and i think that's what i mean by control now you know it's how do you influence or shape mm. uh perceptions by exploiting these um the technologies that are made available you know uh and i I come back to myanmar you know you you drop facebook into myanmar and uh it immediately connects has the potential to connect anyone who's on who has a smartphone who doesn't necessarily have access to the internet i as in they have a data plan Mm. and suddenly facebook becomes the means by which everyone's talking sharing news and all the rest of it and that is de facto the web for people living in Myanmar. But if you had also access to other data sources, you know, and uh, different uh, online platforms that you might take for granted in the internet more broadly, you know, you get something you can leaven your your understanding of the way the world works, as opposed to it all being shaped by one platform. Which sort of gets to the underlying thing, which is quite interesting, which is, as I said, I alluded to, you know, your kids have got three computers going, three screens going, right? Mm. Uh, and there's a sort of they they can you know when my, when my teenager's doing homework and they're telling me that they can they're they're doing homework whilst they're watching a video and I'm like how the hell are you doing homework it just doesn't you know as a guy with a grey beard I'm like how the hell does that make sense it just when I was revising I had a piece of paper and a, a book and I was writing out my notes you know now they've got these screens and so I think what I was alluded to earlier is the sort of splintering of realities 
function as as as, as how we are making sense of the world. Um, but also, what's really interesting is is when we start thinking about how information infrastructures themselves are splintering. Right, mm. you can already see that the Chinese can the great for, great wall of great firewall of China allows. But even there, that's a good instance. You know, the stuff that was being coming out over the um, recently in terms of uh, the protests at the um, COVID crackdowns, that leaked, right? How did that get out when you got the Great Firewall of China? But, you know, that they, they've got a splinter net. You know, they've splintered their own internet off. They've got their own information infrastructure. And so they're, what, what, how reality works for them is different from the how reality works for people in Myanmar. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's happening now. And the more it's going to happen, it's going to commercial exercise as much as anything. You know, Apple wants you to be on Apple telly. So they're going to structure it so that you can keep buying stuff through Apple and all the rest of it. Same yeah. with Microsoft. Right, so you know the the Western platform is going to do the same. You know, all the media scape is trying to not. It's trying to keep you into a particular into your particular demographic where they can sell you stuff. Mm. And that, once that gets hardwired, rather than just software, you know, once it's actually physically splintered, we've got a really interesting challenge in terms of how we come to represent rea- represent the world. How do we make sense of it then? Mm. You know, uh, it, once Twitter, if Twitter dies, where's all the archive gone? Yeah. Who's going to have access? So, you know, we can't even connect to our past, let alone, you know, what's going on in the present, because we're the the the, the where we are thinking about the world is is sort of conditioned by the the, the platforms themselves that we're using and how we connect uh, and all the rest of it. It's um, it you actually uh, I got a bit of nostalgia when you were talking there, um, not because of any conversations we've had in the past, because uh, I try to put it out of my memory, but um. In 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 uh, a few years ago, um, I went I went to Jakarta to uh, give a presentation to um, a, a network of military officers and, and students on digital defence diplomacy. How how the military can use digital diplomacy to engage with partners and in, re- in their region. And and the interesting thing is, you know, I was coming from Australia. Yeah, you know, at the time we had about seventeen million Facebook users, only twenty three million people in total in Australia, and you know, close to maybe 10 million Twitter users. Um, maybe, may, uh, no, sorry, 2 million, uh, definitely not 10. Um, and Instagram was at, at about four and Snapchat was uh, catching up quickly, right? And uh, yeah, so I was going over to Indonesia to brief them who have 132 million social media users. Wow. Internet, but like social media users. And so, you know, the arrogance, this is this is pure uh, Anglo arrogance, right, going over there to give them a brief. So when I got to the, the um, conference, like I knew what I was going to talk about. Most of it was global trends and a lot of it was about um, some of the digital defence diplomacy work I'd done. And, you know, most of it was case study. So I was okay, right? So I wasn't telling Indonesia how they should do it. I was telling them how we had done it. Yeah. I grabbed a heap of the uni students, the non-military folks, um, the young kids, right? These 17, 18-year-olds, and I said... Um, Firstly, how's your how's how's your English? Because my Indonesian is rubbish. Um, there's a reason I dropped it in first year uni, and uh, luckily they all had excellent English. And uh, and I said, hey, what social media platforms do you use? Yeah, and it blew my mind, right? Because they they literally they didn't really describe five different social media platforms. They described five different realities that they were managing and yeah. perceptions of themselves. And, you know, well, this one's the one I engage with my family. This is the one I engage with with these people. You know, this is how I tap into this community. And and literally as we're having the conversations, one of the one of the guys said to his friend, you're on that? I didn't know you were on that. Who are you on that? And he's like, oh, I'm this guy. He's like, oh, we're, we're connected. And the other guy's like, yeah, I know we're connected. But he, he didn't even know um, that that yeah. would be yeah. the same identity. And so that that idea of control, and um, you know, I consider myself pretty savvy, Um for two reasons: one, I'm arrogant, and and two, um, I've got a lot of digital technology on my desk that glows, right? Um, but <laughs> nowhere, like that, my level of understanding and control of my online presence was nowhere near as sophisticated as these these people that have grown up with it. But their understanding, yeah. their control, they could still only control what was available to them, and that's yeah. that's the interesting part of, of of what I find with radical war and what you've described with control is. There's elements of control the users have around their own perceptions, but it's still at a level that's micro compared to the macro levels of control that, that shape the realities and perceptions they're able to receive and then control. They control it after it's already been moderated and shaped. Now, look, we, we could talk forever on this because um, I love this topic. I love new theories of war 
and I love talking. Um, but we need to get to the final question. This is the butcher's bill. Uh, listeners have, will will note that we don't have any uh, bonus questions for subscribers because I binned our entire subscriber plan. Um, the, the reason I binned it wasn't because we didn't have any subscribers. We actually had quite a few. Um, but what we found was the service uh, provision. I wasn't happy with the way that we were supporting our subscribers, so we just binned it, right? So um, sorry about that for all those subscribers. But, you know, we did plenty of months of engagement with you and said, hey, thanks for all the tin. Um we still do the final question because we will never give up on this question. Um, and and the importance of this question is your book is an example of it, right? Um, Big Carl's most important legacy was the idea of thinking and questioning war and what it means at at the time. You know, he yeah. Yeah, he happened to participate in like what thirty seven battles or something, so he had some pretty pretty different types of experiences that shaped it, but. My final question is one that, you know, all guests get on the show and it relates to our mission on the show, which is to define war in as many ways as possible. And that's why I couldn't take the piss out of you too hard about writing a new book on a new theory of war, because that's the whole mission of this show is to define war in new ways as possible. So it's really annoying. Um, But I asked each guest to finish the sentence war is. So right now I ask you, finish the sentence, war is. War is the immediate and ongoing interaction between connected technologies, human participants, and the politics of violence. That's really good. And uh, I know for a fact you wrote that while we were recording the show tonight because uh, <laughs> I was thinking about it. That's brilliant. I was actually going to like say, you know, war is radical, dude. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good one. Um, it's a bit holistic. Is it too wordy? I don't think so. Not in the world of 240 character tweets. Um, yeah, I think we'll accept it on the show. Our listeners will be happy with that. Matthew, thanks again for coming on the show. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, mainly because you boost our stats quite quite a bit because you don't write on boring stuff. <laughs> thanks, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, and uh, keep watching, keep listening, watching, keep listening to the Weapon of Choice uh, episode as well. I want to keep high on those stats there. And even if you don't like, you might like some Radical War, uh, but the Weapon of Choice thing, that's where you do guns. But do some Radical War too. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing that an episode called On Lethality and Knowledge Trajectories is still a massive, a massive um, uh, earner um, and also the Weapon of Choice. It's just... You wouldn't you wouldn't pick it. Um, you know, I'm I'm not gonna lie, I've had much better looking guests on the show. Um <laughs> you, know, you know, it's a proof that uh you know the people who, who are successful in this type of business are people who uh have a head for radio, like 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 yourself, like myself. Um <laughs> but um thanks very much for coming on the show. Ladies and gents, if you are interested in purchasing the book, you can click on the show notes because there's a link there to Amazon now. If you want to support the show and you were a subscriber, but you don't know how to support the show now because I'm literally not taking any money from you, uh, maybe just click on the on the, on the the book uh, link, go to Amazon, buy it, because that's our affiliate link. We won't take any money from from, from Matthew or, or Andrew, and we won't take any money from the Hearst Publishers. They're the publishers of the book, but we will take money from Amazon. And uh, you know what? In this world, who doesn't want to take Jeff Bezos's money, right? He's now going to give it all away, I think, um, I think a certain uh, TV series that may or may not be a parody of his life has uh, might might have made him think a little bit about it. Um, but ladies and gents, thanks again for tuning in to listen. Twenty twenty two has been a disruptive year. If you are interested in being further disrupted, jump on Twitter and engage with Matthew at War Matters and uh, talk to him about radical war. Um, you know, take the piss, uh, have a read of it, um, do what our, our good friend of the show Jason's doing and and putting photo photos of, of different sections of the book up on Twitter and then debating them with Matthew. That's the best way to engage with an author, right? Because then they know their stuff's being read. Um, but until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website, www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.